In part one, we established that God is entirely incomprehensible. We cannot know him as he knows himself, that is, univocally, univocally, but neither does God equivocate when he speaks. God truly speaks of himself, and we can only know him as he analogically reveals himself. God names himself with a name that he alone shares. In the patterns of divine naming, God confirms monotheism while speaking of ordered relations between the divine persons, all while establishing his transcendence over creation. All things are from him, and through him, and to him. Thus far, I have been priming you. I've been tilling the soil for my main thesis, which is that five-point Trinitarianism is Nicene. Before I explain five-point Trinitarianism, or Nicene Trinitarianism, I must explain three-point Trinitarianism, which we might call mere Trinitarianism. Three-point Trinitarianism confesses three glorious truths. One, there is only one God. Two, each divine person is God. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Spirit is God. And three, each is a distinct person. The Father is not the Son. And the Son is not the Spirit. And the Spirit is not the Father. Just as a side note, I think Christians, day one of their salvation, sort of have a one-point trinity. It's, I want to worship Jesus. Zero sophistication needed there. There is a, a Holy Spirit-given instinct or impulse to bow before the feet of Jesus and glorify him as God. Zero theologizing from sophisticated literature required. Where's Jesus? I want to worship him. When you go down that path, it shoots out quickly in the direction of the Trinity. How can I maintain this desire? How can I fulfill this God-given desire to worship Jesus and not be an idolater? We should stop and revel in the first truth of three-point Trinitarianism. God is unique. Certain things are only true of God. One helpful framework for this is that of names, attributes, works, and worship. This is very helpful. Very, very helpful. I don't know of a better acronym for this than NA. That will have to do for now. Maybe some of you Baptist preachers can help me. I don't know a better acronym. Names. God alone is properly called Yahweh. When I say properly called, I mean that the titles we give to God are not courtesy titles. Do you know what I mean by that? Sometimes in human discourse, we give people hyperbolic, exaggerative, superlative names as a kind of maybe romantic uh, ascription or just a, 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 a polite overstatement. God is not uh, in need of courtesy <laughs> in this respect. We give him proper titles, or he gives himself proper titles. He alone is called Yahweh. He is called the everlasting God. He is called in 1 Samuel, the Lord of hosts. Psalm 717 calls him, this is one of my favorites, the most high. He is not the more high. He is not the same kind of being that I am, but of to a greater degree. He is the most high. Scripture says, I will sing praise to the name of the Lord, the most high. You can only talk properly about God that way. Attributes. 
God alone is omniscient. He alone is all-powerful, or as Scripture says, almighty. That's what almighty means. He's all-powerful. He has all might. Jeremiah 23 says that God is omnipresent. There is a sense in which he fills all that he creates. He is immediately present. Think about this. He is fully and immediately present in all that he has created. He is not a distributed deity. He is not like a gas, like Mormon uh, philosophers mock evangelicalism for teaching. We do not believe that God is a distributed gas. He is fully present immediately everywhere. <clears throat> it's especially true in light of him sustaining all that he creates. He is more near to you, I dare say, than you are to yourself. God is immutable in J James 1.17. He is eternal. Psalm 90 verse 2 from the mount. This is a great verse when glorying in the Wasatch Mountains. You look up and you get a sense of how ancient the mountains are. I like to call the mountains here street preachers. <laughs> On the way to work, they preach at you. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth, or from, or the, in the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Works. God alone can do a number of things. He alone saves, Isaiah 43, 11. He alone transforms hearts, Ezekiel 36, 26. He alone can forgive sins, Micah 7, 18. And he alone creates. Listen to uh, Isaiah 44, 24. I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. You might say God is bragging here. Uh, Isaiah is big on God being incomparable. God glories in his unique attributes, his unique names, and his unique works. He alone stretched out the heavens. It was not a team collaborative affair. It was not a co-participatory activity. It was not a Patan effort or a partialized effort. Hey, buddy, you take the front lawn, and I'll mow the back lawn. <laughs> Let's pause here for a second. The works of God uh, that are only done by God are inseparably and fully done by God. Put it, put it this way. All of God is always involved in all that he does. God is never partially involved in what he does. We'll talk about that more, and that becomes very important with the Trinity. And worship. Only God rightly receives worship. Remember Exodus 20, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. Remember in Reve Revelation 22, where John is tempted to worship an angel. <sighs> and the angel says, cut it out. <laughs> you should worship God. In Luke 4, 8, Jesus himself quotes the Old Testament to Satan. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. So there are names only appropriate <clears throat> for God, attributes only true of God, and works that can only be done by God, and worship that is only properly given to God. There is only one God. I did put a period on that. It's like... There is only one God. Let us reflect on the word is. To say that there is only one God, or that God is God, or that God is, is to use the highest form of predication. When I say that a friend is loving, I attribute to him what is also true of others, what is shared by others, and what is common to many others. 
but my friend is not love himself. My friend is not necessarily and essentially loving. He would still exist if he were not loving. My friend's kindness, or love, you might say, is an optional, or what philosophers call an accidental property or attribute. It's not essential. Um, I, I, th I think about a log. If you strip the bark off a log, is it still a log? Yes. The bark is not an essential attribute of the log. My love or kindness is not essential to my very existence. What is true of God is essentially true of God. God does not have accidental properties. He is not merely loving. Thought about this? God is love. You can't talk about creatures like that. God is not merely bright. He is what? He is light. God is not merely spiritual. God is spirit. To attribute anything to God properly is to describe what is entirely true of God. God isn't of a category. He is his own category. God is his attributes. This becomes very important for the doctrine of the Trinity. God is absolute and pure. He is what theologians call simple. He's not an aggregate or a composite or a bundle of attributes. God is not a mixture of things. Everything that is true of God is true of everything else that is true of God. All his attributes, listen very carefully, all of the attributes of God have the same referent as all his other attributes. I'll put it this way. Um, all of God's attributes are, this is really helpful to me, it's a good term, coextensive. Here's a simple way of putting it. All of God's power is wise. And all of his wisdom is holy. And all of his holiness is loving. And his love is entirely powerful and wise and holy. What God is, he is entirely. God is identical to his attributes. There is no stronger use of the term is. God gets the highest use of prepositions, and he gets the highest use of predication. Just as a side note here, this is really good news for your life. When God involves himself in your life, when he commits himself to you, or when he loves you, or when he's for you, he involves his whole self. He brings his entire being. God is never half-hearted or partial in his love for you. He loves you with his complete and unique self. Point two, each divine person is God. Moving on to the second point of three-point Trinitarianism, we confess that each divine person is God. Here the is comes again with the highest form of predication. The Father, again we're using that word, the Father is God. The Son is God. The Spirit is God. What is true of God is true of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Rob Bowman summarizes the following biblical evidence that Jesus is God. And the next few paragraphs are a repackaging of Rob Bowman. There are explicit statements identifying Jesus as God. Can anybody think of one? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
Jesus is identified in the New Testament as Yahweh. Jesus is given many titles or names of God. He is called the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. Who would talk about you or me that way? That alone is true of God. He is called the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He upholds certain titles. There's certain titles that you might use of creatures that he has in the ultimate sense that only apply to God. He is the shepherd. He is the savior. He is the bridegroom or husband. He is the rock. The I am statements declare Jesus' divine functions. He says, I am the bread of life in John 6. His I am statements also declare his divine identity. You ever think about this? Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. The New Testament speaks of Jesus as the highest of all names. We glory in this name. We call upon this name for salvation. We are to be baptized in this name. We receive forgiveness in this name. And we, do ev- we are to do everything in this name. Jesus received the honors that are due to God alone. Love, prayer, worship, doxological praise. Not the kind of praise you give to a friend. Doxological praise Jesus receives in song and fear and reverence and faith. The New Testament describes all of this. Jesus does the very works of God. Jesus creates all that has been created. John, what does John 1, 3 say? All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He sustains the universe. Hebrews 1, 3. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. He has sovereign over nature, sovereignty over nature. He speaks with a divine authority. He gives salvation. He raises from the dead. He participates as the final authority in final judgment. He has all the attributes of God. He is self-existent. He is unchangeable. He is eternal. He is omnipresent. He is omniscient. He is omnipotent. Jesus is preeminent and unlimited in his love, and he is incomprehensible. He is described in the Gospel of John and in Philippians as equal with God. What a breathtaking thing to say if Jesus is not God. Equal with God. Accused, I would say rightly accused, in John by his enemies of claiming equality with God. And then doxologically spoken of in Philippians as equal with God. He sits on God's throne. Think about it. He does not sit on God's throne as a guest. When you and I will sit on God's throne with Jesus someday, we will be like little children who are there by grace. God is not on his throne by grace. This is not a gift to himself. Any honor that I receive is a this is a given honor, and therefore it's, in, it's already intrinsically different from what God has by himself, by nature. Jesus is called the very Son of God, which at least implies, we'll talk, touch on this, which at least implies that Jesus possesses the very same nature as the Father. For Christians to say that Jesus is God is not the mere result of a few proof texts. It is the collective assessment of the New, Te- New Testament. It not only restates what John 1.1 1, 1 says, it summarizes what the Bible teaches. The third point of three-point Trinitarianism is that each person in the Trinity is distinct. That God cannot be partitioned in any way heightens the, minis- the mystery of the Trinity. We spoke earlier of divine simplicity, that God is not an aggregate or a composite or a collection or a bundle of things or attributes is simple. A divine person is not a part of God. A divine person is God. Yet each of the three persons are distinct. Remember the ordered distinctions in the Great Commission of Matthew 28, 19. In the name, baptize what? In the name of the Father and 
of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Or in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, key word here, with God. Point three of three-point Trinitarianism is really stressing the withness between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Again, Robert Bowman summarizes some of the New Testament evidence. The Father and the Son are spoken of as two witnesses. The Father sent the Son. The Son did not send the Father. The Father and the Son love each other. The Father speaks to the Son, and the Son speaks to the Father. The Father knows the Son, and the Son knows the Father. Jesus is our advocate with the Father. It's interesting. John 11, 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. In the second century, you had, for a little while, you had the height of what was called Logos Christology. And it was the early church fathers trying to make sense of the eternality of the Word of God, Jesus as the Word. So they reflected on Logos, the Word, and they spoke of the Logos both at that time as the internal, sort of the very thought of God, eternal with God, in the very bosom of God. And they also spoke of the, the Word as sort of an expression outwardly into creation. So they were you know, trying to make sense of things. And this is where you get the, uh, the anxiety of people thinking, uh-oh, you're, um, you're turning this into a two-God religion. And so you had the anxiety of what's called monarchians. The, the modalistic monarchians said, well, there's one absolute monad of God who expresses himself in different modes, externalized into creation, Father, Son, and Spirit. The dynamic monarchians would say things like, well, maybe Jesus was adopted uh, as a son. Or, uh, you know, and then later you have, well, maybe Jesus was created. And he's not truly God. He's not true God of true God. We'll call him God as a courtesy title. <laughs> but he's not properly speaking of the same substance of God. Why do I uh, say that? Um, well, uh, the Trinitarian discussion around Nicaea really is generated by reflecting on what Clement of Alexandria and Origen and others, when they start really taking more of the titles of Jesus together, and we're going to talk about that later, to think about what is true of the Son, distinct from the Father, and yet equivalent to God throughout all eternity. Sorry, that was a riff. Um, oh, that's, that's why I brought this up. When the early church fathers were responding to the modalists who collapsed the Father and the Son into one person, they pointed to this text, John 10, verse 30, where Jesus says, I and the Father are one. And it's really interesting because it's I and the Father. They're not each other, and yet each is God. I, I mean, that, you, you ever notice that the Book of Mormon modifies this? Is it an ether where it says, I am the Father? Early Mormonism had a modalistic, it's like the Patrick, it's modalism, Patrick. <laughs> early Mormonism had a modalistic uh, early position before it developed its polytheism. It very early on rejected the eternal sonship of God, of, of the Son, and it, and it it had early ideas of kind of a monarchian heresy. Uh, and it flourished into polytheism. But God, uh, Jesus says, I and the Father are one, not is one. There's a, there's a different Greek way of saying that. I and the Father are one. And if you look at the, I think it's the, the testimony of the three uh, witnesses to the Book of Mormon, at this time it says, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, which is one God. So you hear the sort of the, the accidental fluency of modalism in early Mormonism. 
that's another riff. Though we don't have time to fill this out with a similar treatment of the Holy Spirit, this is essentially a summary of three-point Trinitarianism. The three points constitute the focus of 20th century apologetic defense of the Trinity. Here you can see a famous chart that represents each claim. This is an excellent chart. It's very helpful. I had it on a t-shirt and got lots of conversations with waitresses over the years. So. Though helpful, if we stop here at these three points, there are disadvantages. Three-point Trinitarianism does not answer some of the questions we asked earlier. It does not tell us <clears throat> what distinguishes the divine persons. It does not explain why we call the Father the Father, or the Son the Son, or the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit. It does not answer the question of whether these titles, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are true of the divine persons eternally as God is in himself. It does not tell us about the nature of Christ's sonship. Is it eternal or is it incarnational? It does not answer the question of whether the order of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is arbitrary, or whether these titles are mere roles played out in redemptive history. And it does not explain the sense in which the Son doesn't even claim that the Son is of the Father in a way that the Father is not of the Son. Here I point you, for your notes, to Scott Swain's online essay, B.B. Warfield and the Biblical Doctrine of the Trinity. B.B. Warfield and the Biblical Doctrine of the Trinity by Scott Swain. It's also in Swain's 2021 book, The Trinity in the Bible on Theological Interpretation. Swain summarizes Warfield's affirmation of three-point Trinitarianism. Swain also explains, I won't call it a settled rejection of five-point Trinitarianism, but sort of the nascent anxiety or sort of, sort of settled non-affirmation, sort of the hesitancy that Warfield sort of planted the charges underneath the bridge of the fourth and fifth point. He, um, maybe that's a harsh way of saying it, but he set the stage for a rejection of some of the fourth and fifth point. I'll explain that in a bit. That is to say, Swain describes how Warfield, not like his predecessor, Charles Hodge, uh, he held to the three points of the first points of the Trinity that we explained, but he did not affirm the fourth and fifth point, which we will describe in a moment. You're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I believe that much of the 20th century Trinitarian apologetics we have come to appreciate, but I love, that I have greatly benefited from, are downstream from the thinking of B.B. Warfield. Warfield was a successor of Charles Hodge at Princeton Theological Seminary. Warfield was tremendously helpful in many ways. He was excellent. But he did not affirm the more historic and developed Trinitarianism of historic Christianity and Charles Hodge. When three-point Trinitarianism is reductive, when it does not go on to answer the questions regarding eternal sonship or the eternal ordered relations of the three divine persons, when you keep three points at just three points, it creates a theological vacuum into which theologians are tempted to fill with content or claims that depart from historic Christianity. Jumping ahead here for a moment to the 21st century, consider the views of philosopher and apologist William Lane Craig of reasonable faith. First, let me say, I love William Lane Craig. He's a brother. And I've listened to his Sunday school lectures on the way to church in year, years past, soaring into worship of how great God is. He has been a tremendous blessing, and I do not mean to quote him as to cancel him. But practice discernment as you read this quote. Quote, it may, be, it may well be arbitrary which person chooses to play the role 
of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Those titles have reference to the economic trinity, the relations that are played by the three persons in the plan of redemption with respect to the created order. Whew. Craig goes on to say in this same essay online or article that if God had never created anything, he would not be the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He would only be the first and second and third persons. So he's still affirming three-point Trinitarianism. There's one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are each God. And the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father. But he denies that the Father, Son, and Spirit titles are descriptive of something that is true of God prior to creation. They do not teach us something true about God they don't, with respect to fatherhood and sonship that is eternal and imminent within the very being of God. For Craig, these persons play the role of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These titles only relate to what God does in redemptive history. This is what he means by economic trinity. Early church fathers spoke of, I don't know how to pronounce it, theologia and economia. I don't know how to say the words. You can help me out. That's right. One had reference to what God is in himself, irrespective of creation. The other, today more colloquial among theologians, economic trinity, refers to what God does within creation with respect to creation relative to creation. So for Craig, these titles are only relevant to the economic discussion of what God does in redemptive history. They do not speak to eternal, ordered relations. After a debate on the Trinity, Craig received a gift of a figurine of Cerberus, a monstrous three-headed dog that guards the gates of Hades. This gift was, in, was no doubt due to Craig's use of Cerberus as an illustration of the Trinity. William Lane Craig writes, I do not take Cerberus to be an analogy of the Trinity, but he goes on to say, I call it an image of the Trinity. I had a friend that said, I don't think that's better. Oh, yeah, I like that's better. <laughs> I see no problem in asserting that just as the three are three distinct consciences, I cannot say that word in the plural, consciousnesses in Cerberus. So there are three distinct self-consciousnesses, got it, or persons of God, whom we call Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, what you're seeing there is essentially social Trinitarianism. It defines a divine person as a center of consciousness, each with his own set of mental faculties. This, this inadvertently turns the Trinity into three omniscience, omnisciences. Tim Stratton, a Christian philosopher of Free Thinking Ministries, who again is a brother, uh, I texted him a couple weeks ago and I said, Tim, I'd like to quote you in a slide critically. Uh, brother, uh, just wanted to give you a courtesy heads up. And when I gave the dry run talk, I, I, I said, admittedly, I want to give Tim a hug, but I also want to flip a table. Providentially, Tim came into town with the mission team a few weeks ago, a week or two ago, and I got to give him a hug. So he's my brother. I do not mean to cancel these brothers. Tim Stratton, likely with the influence of William Lane Craig, uses the Cerberus illustration as well. Quote, with Cerberus in mind, if Hercules was bitten by the dog, would he explain, ouch, Cerberus bit me, or ouch, one of Cerberus's heads bit me? Either exclamation would make sense. Moreover, since Cerberus is a dog-like creature, Cerberus is canine. Each of Cerberus's heads are also canine because they are what? Parts of Cerberus. 
if Cerberus is a rational thinking thing, then Cerberus would have three minds or sets of cognitive faculties. All of the heads could ever utter, I think that. Again, the term for this way of thinking is called social Trinitarianism, which affirms that each divine person is his own distinct center of consciousness. Again, each with their own set of mental faculties. In the case of William Lane Craig, he publicly rejects the traditional formulations of divine simplicity and does not affirm the eternal beget begetting of the Son. He does, and again, Craig does not affirm an eternal and eternal imminent description of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I submit that this with Craig and Stratton is the result of hyper-rationalism and an inadequate appreciation for the incomprehensibility of God. Can you see now why I started with a discussion of God as incomprehensible, not as a concession, not as a fallback, but as a, a, a doxological foundational starting point of worship? And can you see now why I set the stage for language about God not being univocal, but rather being analogical? In part three, we will come back to this. And we will describe five-point Trinitarianism as the alternative. For now, let's take another break.